We'll just sim simply go through these uh, very quickly and briefly to try to catch you up with regard to the animals. One of the things that we saw this morning is that God indeed cares for animals. And the word care there literally means uh, that he has them in mind to uh, uh, take care of them, to provide for them. And the reason being, he has to keep man alive on this planet for the angelic conflict to have it resolved. And animals are part of that intricate system uh, of life, a chain of life all the way to the top. And so therefore, God creates the animals. Uh, or rather, he cares for the animals. We learned that he owns them. And the point is, once we are bought with a price, he also owns us. As he can dispense with them, he can dispense with us. As he made them for a special purpose, he also made us for a special purpose. That is the lesson there. Secondly, he feeds them. Uh, that sort of coordinates with um, this point under God uses animals for illustration. To teach the believer's value to God. We learned that sparrows in the ancient days were sold for just a meager amount of money. They were very cheap, in other words. And yet, God pays attention to them. Uh, they don't labor, toil, or sow, and yet God feeds them. Uh, also, if one falls to the ground and dies, God pays attention to that happening. And uh, so, the animals teach us that God, too, cares for us because we're of more value than the sparrows. Also, he protects them. In fact, the book of Psalms teaches us that he preserves man and beast. And uh, the word preserve there means to deliver us alive, to keep us safe from harm. Now, don't plow with the ox and the ass together. Uh, taught us that this matter of ecumenical uh, endeavors. Now, we have studied this before as to just how far that we can go. There are evangelicals, there are conservatives, there are doctrinal uh, people, there are dispensationalists. We have studied before just how far you can go, but especially when it's a matter of, of um, definite false teaching. An unbeliever, uh, the donkey, and the oxen, who's the believer? He wants to plow the straight and narrow where the donkey gets distracted and uh, stubbornly opposes his master's will. It does nothing more when you're yoked together with them than to sap the strength of the oxen, which typifies the believer. Also, uh, it teaches wrong motivation in marriage. I like that one. This is the one with the stalled ox. And uh, I've, had, uh, I've had several to tell me that, that my joke about the stalled ox this morning just wasn't funny. Uh, I, I don't make my living uh, uh, as, a, as a comedian, and, and that's okay. Uh, and I know aren't, that you're very glad, hopefully, of that. But better is a dinner with herbs where love is than stalled ox, uh, prime rib, the best of the best of the cut of, of meat. Uh, and still there's hatred in the house. So the animals teach us quite, uh, quite a bit. Also, I like the one about there are some things that you simply have to put up with. Um, if you don't have oxen in the barn, the cribs are clean. You don't have to, to mess with the um, uh, unseemly things of life. But at the same time, it says, there's great increase that comes from oxen. You can prosper if you, if you deal with the things of life that, that are messy and don't run from them and shirk your duty. And so therefore the oxen teach us that if we harness their power, they will prosper us. But then there are some things we simply have to put up with as uh, byproducts. The lion teaches us courage and nobility. He turns not for any. Uh, and it shows that he indeed is virtuous and worthy to rule because he's the king of beasts and uh, he is willing to fight for his position. Also against extreme legalism, the contrast. In the Ten Commandments, God shows his care for animals in that they're not to work on the Sabbath day either. But yet the legalists were saying that uh, if Jesus did a work, a good work for people on the Sabbath day, he wasn't supposed to do it because it was the Sabbath. And he said, now wait one second. 
The rule is don't work. But if there's a necessity, food, water, or if your animal is caught in the ditch and can't get out, don't you on the Sabbath day show compassion for the animals without God judging you? And of course they do. They water their, their beasts. They care for their beasts. How much more important is it to show compassion and mercy on the Sabbath, he's teaching, um, to people? To teach against reversionism. As the dog to his vomit, it says. As the sow to her wallowing in the mire teaches us that when we revert to, uh, from any point or level of our spirituality and go back. Now, I was corrected by our resident English uh, uh, teacher saying that you don't revert back. Now, uh, I've always heard it that way. But uh, she says that you, uh, Pastor, you only say revert. That means to go back. Okay, uh, we stand corrected. A, the dog and the sow, internal and external corruption against going back on God and His Word or against any stage or level of spirituality. And then the last, of course, is, is to teach. You know, this is especially directed for the nation of Israel. They were not allowed to marry not only with other races, they were not allowed to marry with other tribes. Why? Because if indeed their uh, tribes and race was mongrelized, then the seed of Abraham and God's promise to them would be pretty much a joke. Uh, there wouldn't be anything of the seed of Abraham remaining. There'd be too many mixed breeds uh, in there. But uh, secondly, the, the tribal uh, aspect of it. God gave certain parcels of land, certain blessings just for uh, these particular tribes. And so God said, if you're going to marry, you have to marry within the tribe. Now, again, uh, when we teach this, uh, in the dispensation of grace, we're living in, when God has opened up His grace to the Gentiles. And of course, this is now a matter of fact in our current society and global culture. The races are intermingling. What do we do? Reject them? Absolutely not. The grace of God has been provided for them uh, as well as it's been uh, provided for us. So if there is any type of interracial marriage, then we must honor it as legal and bona fide and the like. And uh, if there is any mixing of, uh, of the flesh, we still consider those people <laughs> human beings that uh, that can be saved and love the Lord and can serve him as well as anybody else. In other words, we do not embrace one for one minute any of those radical groups that uh, believe that this one shouldn't uh, uh, or this one cannot be saved. There was a big school uh, controversy years ago with one of the fundamentalist schools saying that people of a different color didn't even have a soul. And that is nonsense. Jesus Christ loved all. He died for all. He cares for all. All of us, regardless of who we are, has potential for him to serve the Lord. And so therefore we love all people as the Apostle Paul teaches us to do. Okay, this brings us down then to the last point of animals in time. Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19. God judges animals that violate his sanctity. Now, have you ever heard the, the phrase, curiosity kills the cat? Well, in this case, curiosity for man or beast that violates the sanctity of God is judged by him. Verse 12, you'll set bounds unto the people round about saying, take heed to yourselves to go not up to the mount or touch the border of it. Whosoever touches the mount shall be surely put to death. There shall not be a hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Now note this, whether it be beast or man, it shall not live. When the trump uh, sounds long, they uh, uh, shall come to the mount. In other words, that's the signal that it's safe. Now, if you will, look at verse number 21. What did God tell Moses with regard to this? 
The Lord said to Moses, go down, charge the people lest they break through unto the Lord to gaze and many of them perish. Now, the reason that I read that verse is to show you why God didn't want man or beast to touch that mountain. It is a matter of curiosity. The word gaze there means that they were putting their nose in the wrong place. They were violating God's sanctity. He himself was going to come down and the people wanted to, uh, just out of curiosity, see God. So they wanted to break through the barrier and be one of those that had God simply to entertain them. I wonder what God looks like. And God's saying he's not going to be anybody's clown. Uh, he's not there just for the purpose of satisfying an itching curiosity. And so therefore, uh, that lets us know that unless we're serious about this business of coming into the presence of God, clean and pure, when the trumpet sounds, it's okay to come into his presence. When the trumpet sounds, it's okay to gather at the foot of the mount. But if we're there, just because there is a circus atmosphere, then the animals teach us that if you violate his sanctity, if you're just there to gaze at God as another spectacle, uh, then you're going to be judged. God would not allow the animals to touch the mountain. Now, in light of the uh, present day uh, circus atmosphere in many of our churches where we do have, and I, I know um, whenever I was uh, uh, in a certain group and an organization when I first came to school. I've told you about this many times. Uh, coming down the, the sidewalk in front of the church was a man who was 10 foot tall, dressed as Goliath. He was walking on stilts. You had your carnival barkers everywhere. You had a big uh, cow as, as big as uh, this church from the Mayfield Dairy Company. It was anything and everything just to draw a crowd for the purpose of bragging at the next um, pastor's convention as to how many people people you had. Now, that is what I call violating the sanctity of God. Just coming to church for the purpose of gazing at uh, the spectacle, the carnival atmosphere. The animals teach us that when we approach God, we should do so with um, reverence and fear. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't laugh at the pastor's jokes. Uh, that doesn't mean that at all. But uh, Obviously, we don't have a carnival atmosphere. Okay, let's move to Job chapter 12. See, in effect, what they're doing is bribing people, uh, uh, as it were. In fact, whenever I taught school down in Atlanta, there was one church that uh, guaranteed five to ten bucks if you would uh, ride their bus and attend their Sunday school class and so forth. They were given, they were buying people in, a, in, other, uh, in order to get them to come to church. Okay, that's wrong. Now we're going to move from animals in time to animals in eternity. The very first thing that we want to see is that Jesus Christ controls the lifespan of animals. We have seen his concern. We have seen that he created them. We have seen that he judges them, oft times in direct proportion to the hardened hearts of their masters. As their masters oppose God like Pharaoh, uh, then they get uh, judged. Now, what is the upshot? Simply this. If you want to be a blessing to your environment and the animal creation, stay in fellowship with the Lord. Even your animals will be blessed. Job chapter 12, verse number 10. Jesus Christ controls the lifespan of the animals. What does it say there? in whose hand is the soul of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. The word soul there is literally the inner life force. Just like our soul, animals have, in a manner of speaking, a soul. Now there's a difference. What is that? Simply this. When God created the animals, he created them to have their soul and their body so interwoven, so attached to one another, that when their body dies, the light of their soul goes out. 
But what's the difference between the animal and mankind? There's a difference. God created man in his image. And so therefore he breathed into his nostrils a breath of life. There's a difference there. Our soul and, and body can be detached as it were. Our body can die, but our soul will go on living forever. The point that we're making here is that, and we'll get to point two in a moment, animals born in time don't go to heaven. When they die, they are done. You've heard this before many times. Evolutionists believe that man is just like the animals. When they die, there's no afterlife. Well, in essence, there's a truth to that. When animals die, there is no eternity for them. Okay? Let's look in Psalms 104. Psalms 104. Now, one of the animals that God made, one of the types of animals, is a dinosaur. Now, I don't know about you, but I have my favorite brand uh, uh, of dinosaur. Uh, you got your uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex. Uh, he, he was the guy with the big jaws and uh, the little arms and the great big legs and so forth and brontosaurus and so forth. Some of them have even been renamed. I haven't kept up with most of them, but I used to know all of them. So I was interested in the dinosaurs just like young people are today. Now, I was told this morning, um, I believe Zed said that um, Barney made $34 million. But Joe told me that Barney made $84 million and was the, one of the highest paid entertainers. For Jurassic Park, Steven Spielberg made $324 million over two years. Now, what, what am I saying? Dinosaurs are a hot item. Dinosaurs will sell. And uh, we believe that these dinosaurs were actually the pets of the angels who inhabited the earth before Adam. They were pre-Adamic animals. But what happened? Well, you will remember the principle. Animals are blessed or cursed in relationship to their master's spirituality. Who, who was the ruler of earth at that time? It, Adam didn't exist as yet. Lucifer sat on the throne. Lucifer's pets were the dinosaurs. Let's see what happened. Verse 25. So is this great and wide sea, wherein are things creeping innumerable, both small and great beasts. There go the ships. There is that Leviathan, whom thou hast made to play therein. These wait all upon thee, that thou mayest give them their meat in due season. That thou givest them uh, what you give them, in other words, uh, uh, they gather. Thou openest thy hand, they're filled with good. But now note something. These verses here have to do with the pre-Adamic creation. I'll show you how we know that in a minute. So the verses that I'm reading about those who were filled, these great beasts who were filled to the full with the lush environment that was on the earth at that time were indeed the dinosaurs. The word Leviathan uh, gives us a hint there. You hide your face. They are troubled. You take away their breath. They die and return to their dust. That was the demise of the dinosaur. What happened to the dinosaurs? Lucifer said, I'm going to ascend into heaven with my band of one third of the angels. I'm going to take over the throne of God up there. And so they went up and Jesus said, I remember Lucifer as lightning be cast out of heaven. Jesus Christ stood up against him and cast him back down to earth. Now scientists tell us that there was a big meteor that went thump on this planet with a mushroom cloud that went up, uh, hid, the, hid the sun from our earth and the ice age ensued and all of the dinosaurs died. Lack of food and they froze to death. But instead of a meteor hitting the earth, it was Lucifer that hit the earth. And do you know what happened when Lucifer hit it? 
It, he went thump, and the dust went up in the air, and the earth cooled. That's why in Genesis 1-1, when it says, and the Spirit of God brooded on the face of the waters, he's incubating or melting the ice pack. How did it get there? From the dust that he kicked up and brought on the ice age on this planet. What did Lucifer do to his pets that he loved? He killed them all. All of the dinosaurs are now extinct because of Lucifer's rebellion against God. And again, the point is, if you love little Fluffy and if you love Fido, the best way that you can bless them is stay in fellowship with God. As soon as Lucifer got out of, out of sync and killed her with God, God killed his pets. And you know what? He caused him to cause the extinction. Now, how do we know that this is the dinosaurs? Note verse 30. Thou sendest forth thy spirit. They are created, and you renew the face of the earth. Perfect environment. The dinosaurs were originally created on this planet. Lucifer, he rebelled, and God sent him back to earth in one crashing blow to this planet. The earth froze, and they died. Genesis 1-2 says, In the Spirit of God, brooded on the face of the ice, melting the waters, in other words, is what it says. That's why verse 30 takes us right back to Genesis 1-2. You send forth your spirit, who is the agent of regeneration, not creation. They are created. In other words, the environment was formed for new life forms to be created. Jesus Christ did that. And thou renewest the face of the earth. It took, it took him four days to renew the face of the earth. On day five, he brought forth animal life. On day six, higher forms of animal life. And then finally, on day six, man. All right. Point we're making. Who controls life? Your family doctor? Well, he helps. He is part of God's system. But if you're out of sync with God, uh, there's nothing you can do or anyone else to keep you alive if he wants you dead. And there's nothing that anyone can do to kill you if he wants you alive. Time and again, this is attested through the scriptures. And the point we're making is if you want your life to be blessed and you want to be a blessing to others, even down to your pets, stay in fellowship with God. Okay. Uh, but please, the, again, the medical profession, we respect absolutely 100%. And they have a part in our lives. But um, what we're talking about here is when you rebel against God, start, God starts bringing those forces to bear in your life to make you extinct. Okay, let's go to Psalms 49 while we're here. Okay, point number two. Animals born in time don't go to heaven and don't enter eternity. Now, how do we know this? It's clearly taught in the scriptures. Verse number 12. Nevertheless, man being in honor abides not. He is like the beasts that perish. Now you say, Pastor, see right here, it says that the man and the beast are the same. Whenever they die, it's the same thing that happens. No, he's not talking about the, the soul separation from the body here. He's talking about the fact that uh, there is an absolute uh, disintegration that goes on. But because we know that animal, an animal soul and a human soul are different, one created in the image of God, one attached to their body so that when the body dies, the soul dies. Uh, that is the, the um, correlation that is being made. This is their way is folly, yet their prosperity approves their saying. Like sheep, they are laid in the grave. Death shall feed on them. The upright shall have dominion over them. Now the word upright there is interesting, simply meaning that justice takes over. 
They put stock in their bodies. They were proud of their bodies. They were proud of their uh, uh, prosperity in an untoward way. And so therefore, God simply judges their bodies. The upright shall have dominion over them in the morning. Their beauty shall consume in the grave. God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave. But, verse number 12 again, Nevertheless, man being in honor abides not. He is like the beasts that perish. Let's turn to the book of Ecclesiastes. Book of Ecclesiastes. Chapter 3. Now, remember, uh, perhaps the, the psalmist there didn't uh, bring it out as far as the English translation is concerned, as, as well as this uh, perhaps will. But there is a correlation. The, the beast lives and he dies, and a man lives and he dies. And the, the beast grows up and he has his prime and his glory. But uh, a man grows up and has his prime and his glory. But both are the same when it comes to death, with this exception. A man enters eternity, a beast does not. Ecclesiastes 3.18 I said in my heart concerning the estate of the sons of men, that God might manifest them, and that they might see that they themselves are beasts. Now, Man is different than the animals, but man is the same in that he is the highest life form on this planet. For that which befalls the sons of men befalls the beast. Even one thing befalls them. As the one dies, so dieth the other. Yea, they all have one breath. How do animals live? Just like you do. They drink water, they eat food, and they breathe the air. We share this planet in common. And there's something else that we do in common, and that is we all die alike. Let's move on. Middle part of verse 19. As the one dies, so dies the other. They all have one breath. So that a man has no preeminence above a beast, for all is vanity. All go to one place, the grave. All are of the dust, and all turn to dust again. Remember the Apostle Paul says in uh, Romans chapter 8, that God subject the whole of creation, though Adam was responsible, he was the top man on the totem pole for this planet. And when he sinned, not only was he cursed, but God cursed the whole planet. The animals were not willingly involved, but he had to subject them to the curse to prove a point. All turned to dust again. Who knows the spirit of man that goes upward? Now he begins to make a distinction. This verse, as well as another one in chapter 12, shows us that the spirit of man goes upward, but the spirit of the beast goes downward to the earth. When an animal die, its soul disintegrates as well. Chapter 12 of the book of Ecclesiastes. When the animal dies, it simply returns totally to the dust. But when a human being dies, Though the body, uh, the death of the body is very similar to that of the beast, one thing is different. Verse 6, the silver cord is loosed. That's the central nervous system. The golden bowl is broken. Uh, that is the cranium where uh, the brain is held. The pitcher shall be broken at the fountain and the wheel broken at the cistern. That is the cardiovascular system that's mentioned. When it all fails and the soul is unplugged from the body, then shall the dust return to the earth, just like the beast. But the difference is, when the beast dies, his spirit goes down to the dust. It disintegrates. 
But when a human being dies, the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. The spirit goes upward as it's unplugged or detached from the body. So again, the point is simply this. Don't become so attached to your pets thinking that you're going to see them in eternity. That uh, the dog is going to be uh, wagging its tail at the uh, pearly gates to welcome you into heaven. That is absolutely not true. All right, let's go to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 19. God did something that uh, was very unusual and uh, very unique. We always say uh, or ask the question, is there life on other planets? And the answer to that is, of course, there's angelic life. Uh, is there animal life on other planets? I would say, based on what we're about to read from the scriptures, yes, there is. Uh, I know of one kind of life that is most probably on other planets. That is horses. <laughs> How do I know? Verse 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, what's the first thing you see? A white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness does he judge and make war. This is why Aaron Biggerstaff says that the name of the Lord's horse when he comes back is man of war. Because Jesus Christ is sitting upon him ready to make war with Antichrist. But what is he sitting upon? He's sitting upon a spirit animal that, that is in, uh, for all practical intents and purposes a horse. Do you take this literally? I do. I take the whole book of Revelation literally, except where it, it, it explains that it's an analogy or a type or a symbol. Everything else is to be taken literally. And so therefore, I believe that that horse exists. He existed from the moment Jesus Christ originally created him. He was not part of the animal creation on the fifth day of recreation. He was part of the original creation, which was perfect. That horse was perfect. He has remained perfect. Now, I don't know if uh, Satan's marauders have horses. Probably they do. Uh, but um, these animals, the one that the Lord has, is absolutely perfect. Now, there are some strange creatures referred to in the book of Ezekiel, and we'll look at these and then we'll close this subject for the time being. Ezekiel chapter 1. And We'll start reading with verse number four. Now, we're going to see these strange creatures. They're animals, and yet they're not. For the life of me, since I've become a Christian, I've read the, the book of Ezekiel, I've gone through seminary and, and heard other thoughts on it, I, I just haven't settled in my mind exactly why necessarily God has done this. But just simply to say, as we see these unusual beings, sort of part angel, part man, and part animal, that God is simply showing us, first of all, using these beings, I'm not going to call them creatures or critters, I, they're not that, uh, they, are, um, they are beautiful, beautiful beings, but a very unusual. But what he does, first of all, with these beings is to typify Jesus Christ and his ministry. We'll see that in, in a moment. But then secondly, to show that life, all of life is interrelated and very important so that if one part of life gets out of kilter, it can affect another part of life and all life, all life forms should live in this symbiotic relationship, watching out for one another as it were. Okay, let me show you by these 
spirit animals. Uh, that's probably the best I'm going to do in order to identify them. Verse 4, Ezekiel 1. I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud, a fire unfolding itself, and brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire. And out of the midst of the fire came the likeness of four living creatures. Now, how are they uh, composed? They had the likeness of a man. Now, in this case, we're looking at, at them as they're coming toward us, and uh, they have legs, uh, a trunk, a body, and arms, and so forth. So the likeness is just very similar to our own. But now note, everyone had four faces. You've often heard the expression, oh, they're two-faced. Meet somebody with four faces. Only in this case, all four faces are compatible, not only with one another, no hypocrisy here, but with the righteousness of God. These beings live in the presence of God and have since they were created. Let's note, they had four faces and four wings. And their feet were straight feet, and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot. Hmm, interesting. They had legs like a man, but when it got down from the knee downward, it was very similar to that of, of a cow. They had hands, the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides, and they had four faces on their wings, and their wings were joined one to another, that they turned not when they went, and they went every one straight forward. Now, <laughs> what this means is um, they didn't all go straight forward at the same time like some big rubber band out until they stretched far and then all snap back together. It just simply means that at one time one face would go one direction and they all would follow, then the next face, then the next face, then the next face, covering the four corners of their responsibility here. All right. Now remember, these angels as well are not only saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. They're also protective angels so, so that nothing can uh, be missed. Four faces guarding these four areas. All right, let's move on. Here's the likeness of their faces. They four had the face of, first of all, a man. Now, how is this like the Lord Jesus Christ? He became a man. Jesus Christ was one who came down to earth and assumed a human body. He was God originally. God is a spirit. But Jesus Christ, for the purposes of the angelic conflict and our redemption, had to be made in all points like as we are. He was thoroughly God, but at the same time, he was thoroughly man. So that when Lucifer, the angel, tempted him, he was lower than the angels in the form of a man. And he didn't use his deity to, his, to an unfair advantage to beat Lucifer. He used his humanity. So this angel typifies Christ in that sense. Verse number 10 again, on one, the face of a lion. Jesus Christ is the what? The lion of the tribe of Judah. He was the one who conquered as the noble lion, the courageous lion, conquered the devil uh, in the angelic conflict. So this again is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. On the one side, he had the face of of an ox. Is that like the Lord Jesus Christ? Absolutely. The ox pictures the fact that he was a servant of humanity, steady and strong in plowing that straight and narrow furrow. Another picture of Christ. They had on the one side that of the eagle. Uh, the king of the birds of the air is the eagle. And the eagle simply puts out its wings and allows the wind to push it heavenward. Jesus Christ put out his wings, as it were, and allowed God the Holy Spirit, the wind, to lift him up to the greatest heights possible uh, in creation. So these particular beings typify the Lord Jesus Christ. But you'll note verse number 11 
Thus were their faces and their wings were stretched upward. Two wings of every one joined one to another and two covered their bodies. Now, right here is where we see the fact that these beings with the four faces were all connected to one another. And again, that is the picture, as we said just a moment ago, that when God created these beings, they were created to show that life, all life should be respected and that all life is uh, intricately entwined with one another so that if one would get out of kilter, all of them would get out of kilter. Case in point. What if the eagle decided he didn't want to, to be an eagle anymore? What if he decided he want to re, uh, wanted to rebel against God? What would happen to the other three? What would happen to the ox who's stronger than all of them? He got to pulling his direction instead of moving together in a cooperative way, doing the glory of God together. Now, what did Lucifer do? He got out of kilter. What did Adam do? He got out of kilter. And when they got out of kilter, what happened to other life forms? The dinosaurs became extinct and our creation became cursed. And that is the point here of these animals and what God is teaching us.